I'm really excited to bring on one of my really good friends, Johnny Horahan. And Johnny is one of the principals of Vintage Builders. Like, you know, are you the principal, one of the principals? I'm the co-owner. The co-owner. And uh, you have the Modern Craftsman, Craftsman podcast. And we've been connected for many years now. In fact, your movie star beginnings with Pella. You came out to Arizona and visited me and we did a video with Pella. You know, but you have so much to offer. And what I love about you, Johnny, I mean, you just have so much energy. You've given so much to the community and, and you're always willing to mentor, to answer questions. And, and you've been just a great asset to me. So I want to thank you for that. So I guess to kick off, I mean, I really want to spend a lot of time in this podcast to talk about starting a business, you know, especially a construction business, you know, how did that come into play? You know, time management, all these things that go into it. So you worked, you know, as a professional, you gave your heart for the company you're at. And then you said, okay, Brad, I'm going off on my own. I'm starting vintage. So talk to us about what finally made you make that jump and start your own company. I find it's a lot. First off, thanks for having me. It's, it, this is reciprocated by back and forth. I mean, my contract is your contract. So you, <laughs> you've already given me a ton when I started this business. So, and it's always great to see, you know, your updates. And it's when I went out there and met with you, it was an eye opener to me, not like, Oh, this guy's got everything and I'm jealous. It's like, he's got everything dialed in where it's like, so it is possible that you can stay lean have a family, make great money. All the above is doable. It's not just a fairy tale. So that it was takes a long time to get there though. It may seem like that. Sure. I mean, I'm with you. It's like when I started my company, I was like, do people make money as a contractor? Like it just, and, and I talked to Matt Reisinger about that too. And it's funny that we're talking about that. It just, it takes time. Like that's the thing. And people don't realize, I mean, you have to build a brain, which I'm sure you're realizing now. You know, nobody you wants to wait now. It's the Amazon yeah. culture that it you is. Know, if it's not prime, I don't want it. And millennials want to get to the top and run stuff. So, you know, it, it is, I mean, when I first started in this industry going way back, I was a laborer. I used to cut lawns when I was in high school and mm -hmm. I was like, all right, if this is really going to be what I do, you know, I was going to be a firefighter. And then I was like, but you only have to work a couple of days a week. I was like, <laughs> am I going to really landscape? There's only so many lawns I can cut straight. And <laughs> then I went, I went to go and like be a carpenter. But that was like, I knew I wouldn't be making great money or have a company in my name for like 15, 20 years. It was, was my, that was my benchmark. It wasn't anything quicker than that would have been, you know, a blessing, let's say, or a miracle happened. So for me, I mean, I started, I had my first company when I was out of college. So I had done this dance once before and I was probably too young and immature to realize I need to step away from my company a little bit to, to help you know, run it, get all my numbers right and all that stuff. But I was too addicted and obsessed with the astral craftsmanship and sawdust to, to give anything away. And that was a detriment to, that's why I love Tyler. One of the other co-hosts of Modern Craftsman is he's just so good about staying in his lane. And I mean, as a GC, the general part makes us kind of spread, spread out and mm -hmm. touch everything. And it's really tough, but you know, then I went off and had my first son who's 13 now and my wife said, you know, why don't you lean on your management degree? So I went to college. I'd gotten a degree in construction management from Wentworth Institute. And it was huge for me. It made, it was like um, getting a superpower. You know, you can be a carpenter and run, run objects and, and see, you know, all the good things in people. But when you had a management degree, I could see the, the value in people and their strengths a little cleaner than I could when I was just the carpenter going, oh, this guy cuts great miters and this guy does this. It's like, well, wait a minute, he can talk to that guy really well. And he can, you know, describe this situation better. It opened my eyes to a different level of communication and, and that. And then um, I ran that for a long time, but then my wife was like, hey, you know, get a real job. So I, I quit, <laughs> like, got the heads when she says she hates it because carpentry is a real job. And yeah. It, it, it's, I wish I could go back to it many, many levels in many days. But, you know, when I left, I went and became a PM somewhere. It was great. Guaranteed salary, company truck, laptop. And I thought for the most part, I was like, you, this is, this is easy for me. I'm not doing the bookkeeping, insurance, comp, all the other things that come along with being the GC and the, the head guy. So I could just focus on execution and communication and with the clients. And that's really what I loved. And it just took off. So I did that with a company for a year, got my feet wet as a PM. And that's when the 08 bubble hit. 
and uh, popped, and that was it. And then they they kind of settled down. I went back to doing roofs. I think I did roofs at, during the day, cedar roofs. And at night, I was do, replacing uh, flooring at the, the children's place at the mall with a flooring company. So I was doing nights and days to kind of make ends meet until I, I became the uh, director of operations at another company, Boston Green Building, which is great. Restructured that whole company because it found that PMing was great for me, but running a business and being able to shape it was so much easier. And, you know, selling projects and getting the right clientele in. Did that for a bunch of years. Then my, my last boss stole me for a great, you know, bump in salary. You know, all the promises of, of I think every company has promised me the company. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and uh, I did that. And then, you know, I ran the rat race for a while, built up a brand, built up a community and a family at that company that I loved. I loved it. Clients were amazing. I still talked to most of them. And, you know, Benny, my partner at Vintage, he came from our last company. I hired him. He was, he actually, I can thank my wife again. She had worked with him many years before that in commercial space. And uh, we basically left just because it became toxic, meaning there's enough to go on with a project where, you know, you're struggling, you know, there's so many people, there's confrontation, there's details, there's a lot of things that have to happen and, and it's very stressful. So if you, you know, it's like a good team. If, if you don't have to deal with drama within that team, you can get so much more done. So it's actually clients are the ones that told me to leave. And then I was, my wife was like, you know, what, well, yeah, they just you saw the potential. Right. And, and I think with you, Johnny, what's interesting when we first met, you hadn't started vintage either. Right. I mean, and I'm like, man, this guy, he has so much energy and passion and seriously, like you're building the brand and running IG and doing all these things. And I, I was really impressed because there were a lot of pointers that I picked up on. And I think that's what people don't realize. They may look at you, Johnny, and be like, Oh, Johnny's super young guy. You know, he has vintage, you know, he's has his own podcast. He's doing these things, but they don't realize there's 15 years there before any of this started that you were, you know, as you said, sweeping floors, mowing lawns, whatever. And, I can relate, you know, I, I grew up in San Diego working as an electrician. I went to school, construction management, worked for two large firms, you know, for seven years. And even then, like, I still wish there was a lot more that I knew before starting my company, right? Because I had those bumps and bruises. I mean, so, so going to that, what made you finally take the plunge? Because here you are, you have the credibility and experience, you've been through it, but what finally made it say, you know, I'm ready, let's go. Uh, it was really one of the, my biggest clients from my last company was just like, you know, you deserve more, meaning if, if either become a partner, you know, because I've always, I don't know if you do it. I actually would love to know if you do that. Sometimes we work with some of some of these amazing clients that had have had great success, not because they've fallen into it is because they've primed themselves. And what I usually often ask is, you know, is it, is it different for you to see success? Meaning like for me, it's really cloudy and foggy and it burns off a little bit here. So I see the last couple letters of success, but I don't see the whole word clear as day. So I asked my clients, I'm like, hey, was it always easy for you to see success? And, and I always want to pick their brain because clearly they've made a good amount of money and they've been successful. And that client who at the time we were building an underground sport complex so they could play futsal soccer year round, it was like $7 million water slide that was a 90 second, uh, sorry, 90, 90 foot, 13 second ride time. And I was just like, what do you think? And he's just like, no, I, I took chances when I was younger that I would never take today, which meant like that he was, he was like, you have two kids and a wife and a house. Like those chances, those are gone. But I took them and I ran with it. So yeah, at the moment it was my, I was risk adverse, meaning I was cool with taking that risk because that success that was going to be at the end of it, I could see it clear as day. And now that I'm, you know, I have a 13 year old son and a nine year old. It's like, oh, well, there's a little bit more to it. So, but he's just like, you know what? Give your boss the opportunity to come true with what they, they promised and become a partner, not just a paper partner, which means it's only on a business card or written in on stationary. It's actually written into the company. And so it was like, all right. So my five year review, I walked in and he told me to give him an ultimatum. And I was like, but if I give an ultimatum, that means I have to then leave if it doesn't work <laughs> like I was stuck on that part yeah and and I could and one of the things that really hung me up was when I left the company previous to that I was like all right this is where I'm going to stay you know I was probably late 30s 
And I was like, this is it. I'm going to, I'm going to bust my ass for the next five years. And this might sound ridiculous, but I was like, I'm going to help build this thing up. So I'll be like number two in the company, build it up. I'll put in crazy hours, whatever it takes. That way I can be at the, at the ground level of this thing and make it happen. So to do all that after five years, create a company. I mean, I didn't create it, but help build that brand, give it you know, notoriety. Everyone knew who we were. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. And then to hey, say, hey, let's hit the reset button. Yeah, and start over. <laughs> that was really where I was like, do I want to do this again? Yeah. And is it worth it? And, and it was actually my wife, again, who was just like, you know what? You, you want this. You, you, it's there. You should definitely do it. And, and then Benny and I talked a little bit. And he's like, I'm in. 100%, like, without even, like, I didn't even finish the question. And he's like, I'm in. And we didn't know. We didn't have any work lined up. So it wasn't like everyone saw us on IG and was like, oh, dude, they came out of the gates with these massive projects. And, and we, we did. But it was just the fact that, you know, I think you and I have talked about this with LinkedIn and everything. And I think when you, whether it's day 100 or day one, you should, every person you meet, even if you're a laborer, so I tell my guys now, the younger guys or anybody, as you meet people, your business cards are dying, even though they come, I call it, I call it the, uh, the COVID handshake when I give them my business card, because <laughs> then they can take my business card and then it's like kind of a handshake. But <laughs> Um, taking down everyone's information and then linking in with them mm-hmm. because that is your basically digital portfolio of everyone's information. And whether you, I use like a, a Gmail account, Gmail, because as you leave companies, they disconnect the emails. But if you can have this and if you need to, it's your Rolodex, why wouldn't you do that? So doing that from day one and then having that. So we actually ask all our employees, whether it's day one or they're with us for two years is that they make, they use the headshots from the company, make an account profile, look professional. Cause when people look up our overhead and profit and they go, oh, so what's it, what am I paying for? They want to look up whether it's LinkedIn or on the website or however they want to kind of investigate. They want to know what, that, what they're getting. You know, they want to know that there's a team involved, that there's a family. It's not just one person reaping all the benefit. So I know I, I would do that. I would, I would build a huge network on LinkedIn that way when it's time to go, people know. So we posted it on, you know, LinkedIn, Instagram. I remember it was like, I was all amped up about this huge launch. I was going to launch it. I was going to let everyone know that we're, we're out and about and we're free and we can do whatever we want. And people, you'd be so surprised that, oh, you know, a, a past client, you know, this exactly happened. The past client was like, Hey, Johnny, you're off on your own. Congrats. I have a client. I have a friend of mine that is trying to build their dream house, struggling through it. And you build dream houses. You guys should connect. I met with them the weekend I left, signed what a three million dollar build that weekend. Handshake. It wasn't. I mean, it wasn't perfect. You're shaking your head like that's amazing. No, I mean it's amazing. It's like just but, but, just a turnaround. But there was there was sacrifice to that. Like that was I made it like hey, well we would do management for a year because mm-hmm. that was the intent. Was that hey, 14 months in, you know, we'd do that. You know, the naive part of me was after 14 months when it turned beyond kind of spec level build and turned into a complete masterpiece. Yeah. I should have renegotiated, but I, I play the long game uh, for, for better or worse. And the goal was, Hey, you know, I'll stand on my word. I'll get this done. You know, two and a half years later, we, we built it and it's an absolute masterpiece. It should be in architectural digest. And, but it wasn't perfect. Is my point. Like there wasn't that perfect time to leave. It was Christmas time. Like, it was like, like, what do I do about gifts, blah, blah. And it was, um, well, there's a few points like Johnny, what's interesting. I love if, if you don't mind, I was taking some notes when you were speaking and because there's a few points I want to touch on. I mean, one, you talked about the digital portfolio and I think it's funny. I was fortunate to go out to the LinkedIn global conference a couple years ago. And one of the panel, uh, guests, they said something that stuck with me to this day. And they said, personal branding is permanent job security, right? Yep. And, and that rang with me because I thought about how that plays with social media and just marketing. And, and Johnny, that, that's exactly what you're saying here because you, had, you, you represented your brand for your company unlike anyone I've ever seen. But notwithstanding that, you were still, you had a personal brand, you know? And so 
that personal brand, the likability, the relationship side, the networking and where I do the same thing. I get someone's business card and I go connect with them on LinkedIn, right? Because that's that connection for later or Instagram or whatever it may be. And by you doing that, by you creating this network and that personal branding, well now, okay, here's vintage. So I have the personal brand. I have the network and people say, oh, Johnny, like, I love that guy. Like he did a great job, the best PM. I'm going to hire him and refer him. And then it turns into the second aspect, which most of us as you know, as we start this conversation, you think starting a company that overnight success, it doesn't happen. You have to have lost leaders in sales. You have to have lost leaders as a business. Like I have to take jobs to say, okay, Brad, I'm not going to make a huge margin, but I'm going to be in this community or HOA. And that's what you did. I'm going to get this custom home. We get our sign up, we get our foot in the ground and yeah, Maybe you could have charged more money and negotiated, but you're looking at this as the long game and there's value there. And that's what has kicked you off. Yeah. I mean, it, that product's gotten us three other massive builds that have gotten us a Investment. better percentage than we had even on the books when we started. I know we've picked up, we've gone from Benny and myself ran the first year, just the two of us. And I think we did three and a half million. And then year two, we bumped to four people and we did 7 million. And so now we're approaching year three and it's, we're, you know, doing the books now, but it's, I mean, we, this'll be, we're up to six employees. We're hiring our, our next person, but now it's more, we're pulling ourselves out of the day to day. That's what I think. One of the questions I had for you is when in your career at AFT, was it that you stopped running sites, running, running jobs and you started just kind of coordinating from, from afar, you know, never losing touch. Cause I think that's what people forget is like, Oh no, I don't have to do that anymore. It's like, well, yeah, it doesn't the case. That way. Yeah. people po then, then people poach your PM, yep. you know, and, and then they do whatever they want. So you still have to be a value to their project. But when did that happen for you? No, that's a great question, Johnny. So I would say year four. So year four is when it really clicked. There were a couple things. One, I realized for us as a company, like we're not going to get the jobs that we want, the projects or the business development, unless I'm out there doing that. And if I'm in the field and I'm running jobs, which I was doing through the first four years, first off, I, I was seeing just not some balls drop, but I was seeing some issues we had as a company. Some of the, you know, some of our other superintendents, you know, they didn't have the supervision. They didn't have the training. They didn't have the systems. And so we were missing things. And and I saw that at year four, I was like, you know what? I have to take a step back. I can't be in the field. And there's going to be an investment up front hiring people because now I can't cover my salary as billable right in the field. But I should have done it sooner. I mean, the reality is I look back now and our company, once I stepped back out of the field, we accelerated. And we were able to now start dialing in our processes and sy systems and communication and really get where we needed to be as a company. I mean, are you at that point yet? Uh, we're right there. We're on the bubble. So, I mean, on, ideally it's going to have to come from Benny. So Benny, the, the goal, Benny and I both still PM projects mm -hmm. on, a, on a daily basis. And we have superintendents and then we've kind of shaped some of our assistant PMs to be, you know, in the PM role. But as you, as you give more slices away of the pie, you have to then give off the financials where they have to do the billing and they have to then, make sure that when you get the, you know, irrigation proposal, it matches up with the budget. We've been doing all that ourselves. And the guys that are on the ground are just basically running the day to day. They're just pushing and getting everyone to be there and, and make sure orders are being met. That way you're doing the low level stuff, which is site cleanliness, site appearance, making sure dumps are portage on all that stuff's there. And then all the materials are there for the guys. So that way it's, it's, you know, you're not getting a hole. I'm not calling a plumber to be there, but yet the stone never went in the bottom of the hole for the rough in for the basement. It's like, so you, those, that's what their initial thing is. But as you give them the financials and then you have them do client meetings, which is like two, three hours, cause they don't know how to manage the time of the client or their own. Now they're doing that and then they're sucked off the job for three hours with the client, then production falls. So some people can pick that up very, very easily and being able to do both where it's like, all right, Hey, while I'm in this meeting, there's probably five things that are about to fall off the face of the earth. And like, it's going to screw up the next three weeks. So yeah, you can jump onto that right away or it's our job as business owners to manipulate that system where we get a superintendent in there to kind of 
you kind of offset some of those things that so they can really focus on the client and not be like, well, my phone's ringing off the hook. Because at every meeting, it should feel like that client, I know it's tough to do with social media, but that client should feel like that is the only job you have. And that's what we try and instill on every project. Like my phone's always on vibrate. I don't want it ringing in the background because they're like, well, he's definitely focusing on it, even though he's not answering it. So it's like, how do you do that? So we've done that. So Benny's going to move into more of the CFO role. And we'll both be director of operations. So still hitting job sites, still attending every client meeting that's on our, our areas. But he'll move into more of the CFO role, which will be, you know, finances, making sure bills go out and, and happens at a timely period. Because that's where really most of our focus has been client expectations and having a good experience and then making sure that we have a good pace on construction because you don't want to just fall off and be stalling out, especially in COVID. It's really tough to keep an, a, a, you know, ahead of everything, meaning, you know, appliances, everything has crazy lead times now and making sure that you're having that where there isn't a hiccup. So we've been able to do that. So we are, um, we're approaching year three and we are trying to phase into more of, I'm trying to take a step back completely. It's just like, you know what? I, not that I'm putting my dues, but it's like, dude, my, I got a 13 year old. <laughs> I, I gotta, I gotta be around. I can't say anything. You got like a million kids. <laughs> <laughs> you're always on vacation and you're always <laughs> chilling with the fam, always having that dinner with the fam, whatever it is. <laughs> and I'm like, God, whenever I'm with the fam, I'm always like, I, I don't even pick up my phone. I'm always like, you know what? I'm just going to enjoy this moment, but you even have enough, you know, time management in your head you're like i can even story this you know what? i'm out i'm not even with the you know i got time for this and i still i freak out that clients are going to watch that and go why aren't, i really have this hard dilemma where i am at the mercy of the project almost still in my mind on a mm-hmm. daily basis so it is hard for me to pull away but i'm glad that you said four years because that just solidifies the fact that i'm on the right you're ahead of the game man Again. You're ahead oh, of the game. I got a whole year. I got a whole year to get my act together and I'm still on par well, for success. Well, I love that you said that because, you know, to take this a step further, it's interesting. I saw, you know, as our company's transformed, so four years, and, and to put this in perspective, we're coming up on eight years as a company, mm-hmm. right? So four years ago, I, I step out of the field and we, you know, we make that transition, you know, and, and for our team. I, I think even more than that, and, and you're alluding to this with Ben, is that when we took the biggest jump was about a year and a half ago, maybe a year ago, I brought in, well, we promoted uh, McCall, who's in our office. She was one of our coordinators, and she was getting her MBA in finance, you know, super talented, really created some structure with the coordinators as far as billing and things, and she was promoted to controller. And what I found was having somebody now that could take that burden off me that really understood the, the billing, the numbers, the draws, you know, we're working with a lot of clients that either are construction jobs, draws monthly. We're doing some remodels that might be billing every two weeks. We're doing with cash clients. You know, as you mentioned, you have deposits, you have trades that need to get paid in a timely manner. We have some smaller subs that have to get paid quicker. And so for her to take that and the financials and forecast and, to really say, Brad, you're spending this much on marketing or you're spending this much on porta johns you know, to really understand the nitty and gritty so we're preparing ourselves, I should have done that sooner, even more than me stepping out of the field and you're on track because I think this was year six and this should have been year one. And it's hard to do that as a small company though because you only have so much revenue, right? But if you can have someone at a controller or CFO that's running that, Johnny, I mean, it is, it is game changer. I, I really saw our company change when that happened. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I think the problem is, is that, you know, if we have enough time in the day, let's say it's, you know, eight hours, you can't devote three hours of it to controlling, you know, to, the, to those responsibilities. And that's what it deserves. So that is the move is, and like you said, you know, you do have to watch the numbers. Like we're going to spend, you know, when you acquire an employee, yeah. that, bur- that burden is massive. And, and people just kind of, I mean, I never really looked at it when I was younger, like, oh, you know, I'm working for this company, blah, blah. And I never really recognized the the burden of like salary, insurance, comp, health Help. insurance, you know, Call bonuses, that. Christmas. Like yep. I'm thinking about Christmas bonuses. Probably I was thinking about it two months ago, but it's like, yeah. what are we going to do? This year? We have six employees. Like I got to be on point. It's like, and I got to be honest with you last year, Ben and I didn't get them because we wanted to make sure like, there's that saying like leaders eat last. 
And our goal was to put everyone in the right place. You know, we moved company trucks around, got people where they need to be. And ideally, it's not like you do it once. I hate to say it like that, where it's like, oh, I did it once and now I'm good. No, it's like you always have to have a touch on that as well. But I mean, going back a little bit to what you said before is the biggest thing is I move from a, a, a billable time where I am like, we have a, we, we, we have our, uh, I think you've probably seen my spreadsheet, but it's, we have a, a slot that's, you know, construction management, which is X amount of dollars a week that we can bill for that job across a bunch of jobs. And for the first three years, I've been under that category. I've been, I've had a tab. Mm -hmm. So now it's like when you start moving things around, now I am part of overhead. So it's like I, these guys have, it works out well, but it's like you have to make those numbers work. And I have, you know, my, my notepads that have all my numbers broken out. So I know where all the numbers are going and I can't wait to delegate that factor of it, but I, I still want to know where everything is so I can sleep at night. But that's the goal is that now I'm going to be overhead. And for the longest time, it's like, you keep calculating products. It's like, all right, do I pick up four more products to cover my salary in a, mm -hmm. in a PM? It's like, no you pick up better value projects that have make sure your numbers are right for OMP. So we went from 13% in the beginning, which was probably light depending on the project for, for new construction, new construction versus renovations. I found that are, are, are very different, very different price point. I mean, different products in, in the most part, but now we're upwards in the 18% range for that. And that's not part of the management. I know we're getting into numbers, but that's a big jump. As the growth happens, you can't just grow you can't start a company. Sometimes you start it with what you can get, but then you have to dial in your numbers, regardless of your control. There's no excuse. Know your numbers, track your numbers, and then evaluate them as you bring employees into the mix that, hey, do these numbers still work? Every company I walked into years ago, I'm like, hey, so what's your OMP? And they're like, 12%. Uh, I'm like, how'd you come up with that? We just guessed. <laughs> and that was the answer for almost every yeah. company I was ever with. Same. And it's crazy and they don't know. And the thing is, it's funny because you kind of take that mindset like I did. And then my controller's like, Brad, you can't do that. You're not going to make money on this job. You're like, okay, well, why? And then they break it down, you know, but I guess going to that, Johnny, I mean, if, as you've raised your fees, how do you deal with the pushback when a client says, Hey, Johnny, I can go hire X, Y builder down the street and he's going to be 5% less, you know, how are you handling that conversation? Well, there's two things here. I mean, when, when you have social media and people see these images and they want these images, they have to understand what they cost. You know, they're not, they're not just, you know, a dime a dozen. If they were, then you'd see, you'd see Instagram and Pinterest just covered with amazing images. We all see those because our algorithm says that, but there's also a huge group of photos that are junk, that are people trying, that are growing, that are they're trying, to, they're trying to mimic the execution that we give. Mm -hmm. that are, that's inspired. And I get that. And but, the, you know, be misleading to what the real quality is when you walk in there and handle the cabinet, you know? Yeah, it's all that. And, and it's, it's, uh, it comes with experience. I mean, we've all, I've looked at it uh, quite a bit where I look back and with my son and I'm like, yeah, I used to do this. Cause he asked a lot of questions and I'm like, and I'm like that basement rental. I don't know if I'm even like, if I, I always look at it this way, if I had a website in the, in the old photo that was on the website, like, you know, when you did it three years ago, I'm sure you have images now where you're like, I don't know if I should yeah. have that up anymore. I don't know if I can like, post that. Yeah. He's like, I should take that down and update it with something else, like a blank page or something like, just cause you've evolved with your subs, with your execution, with your design. Like for us, I know I'm getting in a rabbit hole, but for us, like we used to be able to do products. I used to pride myself in doing 6,000 square foot houses or a little bit more, you know, plus minus in like eight to 12 months, you know? And, Eight, depending if it started in the summertime and you get a lot of good months in the beginning that are weather. But now it's like, I found that I struggled for a year where I was like, why is nothing going? Like I would have, I have my Microsoft product schedules that I've had written since college that I've always been manipulating. And it's like new house, this is what it is, a square footage. And then I would track great on these products and then I'd start to fall apart. And I'm like, what is happening? And then it wasn't until I talked to Tyler again and Tyler was like, you know, what are you putting in for details? Is it like the old house you did two years ago that you're using as a template? I'm like, no, you know, we're doing this staircase. We're doing, he goes, you're not factoring in the layers of detail that you're adding. You know, it's, it's like having multiple layers over a spreadsheet where you're like, oh, this is this, this is that. You were doing two layers before. Now you're doing 12 and you've grown, but you haven't realized that you need to update your schedule. You're trying to squeeze all that into 12 months again. And that was a huge thing for me to realize. And, and that's, 
that was tough. Really tough. It's, it, it, it's really hard. I mean, that balance and, and that's something that we're tracking. Cause I feel like you're still never an expert. I mean, construction ebbs and flows. I mean, I look at it now with COVID, you know, there's delays on without going off the brain, air conditioning, condensers, right? Lumbers doubled. I mean, you know, it's appliances. I mean, now the, on a side note, there's a side venture we're, we're chasing and, and, you know, they're dealing with aluminum shortages, right? And, and that's, I mean, Coca-Cola is dealing with aluminum shortages. So you're trying to factor this in. It's, you know, you're always going to have to do that. Uh, but going back to that, John, I mean, if you were to start today, I guess, what, what would you do different? Because you've had a lot of experience up to this point. You've had now three years as a company. I mean, what would you focus on? Would you focus on marketing, on systems, you know, uh, billing, you know, business development? I mean, where, where do you see the biggest need? Uh, I find, I mean, some of the things that we did that I wouldn't do again, and I did it based on fear was, so we did, we, we did a little bit of everything. So we did, we did a couple of specs that we did and we did it based on a, on a fixed fee. So meaning we weren't attached to the sale of these houses, meaning, Hey, you know, we would take a percentage in equity deal. And, and I was worried that let's say the house didn't sell. I needed to keep the lights on. So I didn't take any deals that would benefit me on the long road but also be at the risk if it didn't sell because I didn't know what the market would be like. So I wanted those guaranteed funds in. And then we did a lot of these customs. Um, I, I think I wish if I had done it differently that we would have been able to, I mean, obviously if you could have, you know, vetted out some clients ahead of time, it would have been great, <laughs> but we couldn't. And honestly, hindsight to me, now that we're doing it now and being an equity deal in some of these specs that we do, and we do the specs because ideally the market's not there. You know, what, what people call spec in, in, in air quotes, luxury and custom, it, it's such a diluted word. So we try and really build a really custom quality home at your entry level. And that's really, it's something that people can walk. And understand that, and see it. I mean, exactly. with cost of labor, I mean, how do you do that? How do you build a very well-built product, which I know you're passionate about Johnny and then still make it at affordable price. So it's really doing the research and using your, your, your connections and your experience, meaning like, let's say Cucum Brothers for a great example. You know, I, I find that everything that gets built is a box store type of product, meaning it's whatever I can buy out of a catalog, whatever I can see and grab that's tangible within an hour or like, oh, let's, let's do this baseboard. Let's do this chair rail, whatever, stair balusters. It's from stairs.com. It's from the local box store. So we prided ourselves on finding, you know, details that are, that are still simple simply available to us meaning i just had to create a network of people like cucumber Brothers. it's coming from new jersey but i'm not overpaying for that stock but that molding speaks you know you know levels above whatever you see mm -hmm. and so whenever people walk through our houses it's like wow what's up with these moldings and it's like this is our level this it, this is what we're bringing to the table this is our base this is our catalog this is what we pull from it's just i'm using 24 years of experience instead of being a guy, what's, what's, what I see happening a lot is everyone in a pickup truck's being a GC. And then everyone that's got a finance background or whatever is now a developer. Mm -hmm. And they're just literally driving around, getting names off of trucks, and they're trying to copy blueprints and running with it. So like, I can't tell how many people go, hey, how, how high is a chair rail supposed to be? And it says it right in it. Like the chair bumps the wall and that's where you put the height of it. <laughs> and it it's an experience, but people aren't learning that. So what we try to do is really maximize our relationships, not take stuff at a discount, but really go, Hey, what's the best package? Like talking to Ryan and Cucan, what's the best package for my, like my spreadsheet kicks out everything for those square foot houses that are like 6,000 or let's say 3,400 square feet, two levels. And then it's like, Hey, this is, I have $24,000 for trim. What can I do for that's going to make a statement? And, and honestly, a lot of this business is leveraging all the effort onto somebody else. Like I said, it's about PM. It's like, Hey, you coming tomorrow? That's the wrong statement. You've now opened it up for that person to say no. So instead of me going, Hey, I can't make this happen. Why not just ask your supplier and be like, what, what would you put together for a combo to make a statement for this? And Ryan's done that and it's been lights out for us. So then I can still make little tweaks. But for me, the burden's on me because I have to order that stuff three weeks in advance than I normally would. That's not bad for the statement it's going to make. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I make that effort? And then it's having relationships with, with plumbers and electricians and that stuff and going, Hey, 
you know, before I put out the refracted ceiling plan, you know, is this too many recess? You know, we'll talk to my electrician and go, is this enough to light this space or is it too little or should we readdress some of these areas and go decorative? And I found that, you know, we've, we found a sweet spot besides obviously lumber prices going up, but we found it that, you know, with, you know, the Marvin elevates doing all the right packages that has really put us in a good spot. So that way they're very high efficient homes, but they're very, they're cozy. They're not overbuilt. You know, 10 foot high ceilings is something that is something that's beautiful, but it elongates the windows, it stretches them. So you spend more money there, but it, it's how do you do it with great design that's timeless that will then have all the details that you sprinkle in. But, you know, the real answer is, is just using years of experience to try and dial in the numbers and know what you're going to get for a kick. You know, not like, oh, I'm going to put in eight inch floors. You probably could have gotten away with six and made the same statement and not burn 12 grand that you could have yeah. spread out over four of the line items. You no, know? I love that you shared that. It's funny. I, I, I feel like it's a commercial mindset because what I've seen from my, you know, doing commercial work, Johnny, is that it's very similar. You know, when you're working on these design build, maybe a vertical hotel, you know, the, the GC will sit down with the structural skill company and say, okay, you know, the architect has designed this as X, but I want you to look at this. If you were to do it or VE, you know, value engineer, if you were to design this, how would you do that? And what does that look like? And they, the subcontractors and trade partners spend a lot of time working through that design. And it's very similar to what you're doing where you're going to Cucum brothers and saying, okay, guys, I have 24,000 for trim. I mean, this is way different than a box door. That's going to be pretty standard. So what can I do? You know, or okay, the, the mechanical engineer designed our mechanical system such as this, but let, let's look at this realistically based on the way we're building the home. How would you redesign this? And then it makes them, instead of just pricing whatever, I mean, you're giving them a little opportunity, but you're not wasting a ton of your time either. You're putting ownership on them. But that time, that time you're putting in isn't wasted either. It's just like, it's same as design. You know, a lot of people are just, honestly buying designs through a website that will fit the criteria of a, of a real estate agent, you know, X amount of square feet, X amount of room counts, all the stuff that I can't stand. So it's also sticking to your, you know, your values. You know, it's like, I, I forget the last house we're doing right now. That's, you know, we're pushing on vintage development because we're trying to separate the brands a little bit. And it was like the realtors really pushed this investor to come up with their own design with our architect. And it was like, Oh no, I want to do this crazy. I love staircases. Like I value staircases because old houses, they, they really said something in a home. Like they were always something special. They were always a focal point and, and they're kind of getting lost. They're kind of just cookie cutter and just, Oh, it's, it's a necessity. It's a, it's a, a way to travel from point A to point B. And I remember the, the, the real estate agents were like, yeah, you know, we're going to get rid of that, that staircase. I, in my head, I'm like, that's super cool. You know, like we want to put a hallway in and just put a straight stair. And I'm just like, like crashing my head against the, the wall and I'm in the screen. And I'm like, can we just sell this? So going back to like what I would change every house sold for us, all four or five specs. So looking back, it was like what I thought was risk. Again, there's that cloudiness to see through the success was like they all pre-sold, so there was no risk. I could have taken less money up front and used my management and my OMP as equity into the deal. And I instead of taking whatever it was, let's say you look at the project and I'm, I'm walking away with 13 to 15% on, on a spec, I could have walked away with 25% by waiting to get a check at the end. And it's like that would have been really what would have given me an ability to weather the struggles a lot better, but that's a hindsight. So now after, you know, two years, anything that we do, that's that part of it. And again, a client also said the same thing. It's like, you, you bring such a value in, in, in execution and in detail into a project. Cause there's never a time. And that's not just a brag is that someone walks through a home and goes, this is unbelievable. It, it is all the time. We've had clients that built houses for, for a previous boss walk through one of our specs and go, I, you need to find me land. We're going to upgrade and we want this. And it's like, I love that. Like they've, they've lived in a product that we've built five years ago and it speaks volumes. I read an article, God, 10 years ago. I can't believe it, but it was like only like the top 10% of our industry gets repeat business. Most of it is done because a, no one will renovate the house again, or they only buy one new house once. And I know the market's changing, but 
if you can get repeat business and a client comes back to you because it's been a good experience, you're in the top 10% of the industry. You need to value that. You need to market that. You need to put that in every billboard, the side of the truck, whatever you can do, because you did it. You made it through the honeymoon. You dated, you did the whole nine yards and you got to an anniversary and it didn't fall apart. That's tough to do. It is tough to do. It's funny. I always say, you know, if you, you say laughable, but if you can get to the point at the end of the project, where you can have dinner with your clients and you're successful, right? And people don't realize you say that lightly, but I mean, it's a venture because I'm sure for you, Johnny, it's the same for us. I mean, these are two year endeavors or more by the time you engage and architect design, pre-construction, wait for permit, do the build. I mean, these are emotional processes. And if you don't have that good communication, but to your point, I mean, if you have repeat clients, you're a step above everybody right. else. It means you've done it right. And that speaks volumes because most people don't do that. And they don't know how, they know how to do the beginning. They may know how to do the middle. They might know how to do the end, but they don't do all three really well. And, so how, and that, be but how does a company get to that point, John? I mean, you, I, I know you're because your personality and, and your drive. I mean, you're pretty unique, you know, when you're running a project and you actually have a lot of knowledge, right, of how things are constructed and built and the labor behind it because you've worked as a subcontractor. So you have a lot of knowledge, you know, but how does a company refine that education for the staff? And I guess where I'm going is when, when do you hire? How do you hire? How do you train? Because you and Ben go off, you have a lot of experience, you're starting. Well, now you've hired four, you're at six. So how, you know, it's, it, it, every time you hire someone, it gets a little farther from who you are and the way you do things. So how, how do you hire, how do you find the right people? And then how do you train them so that you just don't kick them off the end of the pier? It, it's extremely um, scary. <laughs> um, it's, um, I, I want to say it's a lot like being a, a, probably a 40 year old person trying to date again. I, I feel like it's the same thing. It's like, well, what do I even do? How do I even start this? You know, I've, I've only done it one. No. Um, I think it's, it's a lot like finding the right clients that, you know, you said it's, it's a two year endeavor for some of your builds. It's a relationship. When, when you're meeting that client, it's not just about checking off the boxes. I, I really feel like the right answer I have for you is, is finding the, the little things, the little idiosyncrasies, the, it, it's almost you're baiting a little bit in conversations in the beginning. You're trying to figure out, what it is like I had, a, I had an interview with a kid today benny loves him he's probably gonna hire we're probably gonna hire him and he gets on the phone with me and everyone's like you know so i, I came out of college and i i built this you know 14 million dollar build and i'm like so what was your role when you came out of college like everyone i, I you'd be foolish do you think that i'm the owner of the company and wouldn't know that you were the only person there that built that project <laughs> okay like the fact that you're taking credit for it yeah it raises a flag to me yeah you know, be like he goes, well, I was assistant super. So you were the fourth man down. <laughs> you were taking photos every week for the, the time lapse, you know, from the same spot. That was your job and coffee at the client meeting. So, you know, it's really, it's knowing the experience, but also, you know, trying to find that trigger. Yeah, I came at the person pretty aggressively. Like, what was your role? You know, what, what did you do in that to build that project? You're taking credit for it, but what did you do physically in wanting to, you know, I, I wasn't so crass and callous. I want to say when I was younger, I used to always be like, Oh, my, my clients will never screw me. They're always all great. And even some of the greatest ones at, at some point they turn and, and it, you never know when it happens. It, they're few and far between. Thank God, knock on wood. Um, but it's, but they do hard. and it happens and it's hard to manage those expectations perfectly. Right. Yeah. Even if you did it right, I've told, a lot of my, so going back to the educational part to, of people, I, when I was a director of operations at BGB and everywhere else, I had to hire people and you had to teach them what's going on. And you had to understand, you had to forecast what they were going to, what was going to happen. Like it, it just happened the other day where I'm like, Hey, you know, we got the appliance delivered and I'm letting John run his stuff. And that's one of our PMs, new PM, you know, having gotten business cards yet, not there, not solidified. <laughs> Label's not there, but so he gets all the appliances in and I go, Hey, you need, you're going to need to get the stove and the fridge into the kitchen, like in place, like put it on the masonite, get it in place. Cause it's going to be an excuse. It's going to be, the plumber's going to walk in and go, he might have 14 other things to do, but he's going to see that the stove's not in and the fridge isn't in. 
Yep. And, and so, that's going to be their excuse. Yep. And it's like, and I, so I say that, and then I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like the, the micromanager of me would be like, all right, grab the, grab the movers, get everything moved in. Cause it's in the garage. And then the next day I kind of scroll through and I'm like, so, you know, where's the plumbers? And they're like, I don't know yet. So I reach out to the plumber. The text I get back is, Hey, let me know when the stove and the fridge are going to go in and we'll bring the guys back. And I'm just like, that was two days. Didn't we talk about the exact forecast that was going to happen? And then you didn't value it. And now we don't have people there. So I don't have a set for education wise. I don't have a set process. Nick, the other guy from uh, the other host from the modern craftsman, he's all about written, writing down processes. And, and I've been the guy that's written processes for companies. And I think it gives you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Brad, is a false sense of security. When you write all these processes down and I get for behind the scenes, like bookkeeping and, and payroll and all these little, you know, check, checking the boxes off. I get that. But on site, writing down processes for like pre sheetrock, you know, pre board, it, it's, it's really tough for just to put a checklist together and be like, Oh, did you check it all off and sign the bottom? Yeah. Okay, great. And to think that that's going to stop you from, you know, different things from happening. I just really honestly, and that's probably why I don't have enough time in my day is that we're two and two years in approaching three is that I am there every day during those parts of the process that I know are going to be difficult. They're going to be big transition points. They're going to be parts where could make it or break it or could be a huge detriment to quality. And so I, I don't hover, but I'd be a teammate that, Hey, you know, or I see it and go, Hey, Ryan, come over here as well. Let's get two or three guys over here for this part of the phase. And you know, that way, you know, when it's going to be crazy. So the key is to put enough leash, uh, enough slack on the leash that, you know, it's like a dog that runs to you and then, then it gets, it gets snagged up by the leash and they choke a little bit. It's like, it doesn't hurt the dog, but it also doesn't hurt, but they now know their limit. And it's to try and find that limit and, and try and put 10 to 12 things on their plate when you know they're only comfortable with six, but make sure they have support for those other six things. So that way they know when they're done that they can do 10, no problem and they've increased their flow and their management and their, their exposure and their, you know, their ability to do what they didn't think they could. And it's finding the good things in people and showing them strength. And people always say, you know, what's my growth in a company? You know, is it, is it a label? Is it a truck? Is it a salary? No, it's, it's how do you gain knowledge? And when we see people, it's like, you can go work for somebody else. I don't know them from a hole in the wall, but if you work for them and you work for us, you could work for them for five years. And you would learn in two years, everything with us. Cause the exposure, the pace, the subs, the design, the critical thinking that you need and the support you get from us. I mean, Ben and myself and the rest of the team in architects and, and being open where you don't like have to email the architect in this formal way and just give them a buzz and be like, Hey, what's the, what's the option for this? Or find another option, you know, and think outside the box as if it's your own company. The hardest part we find is that, if, if you softball it and you, you set everything up, then your employees just become robots in a way. They go through the motions. So when things do come up, they're calling you going, hey, so I found this conflict. Great. That's awesome. Uh, you shouldn't call me about a conflict. You should tell me about the solution that you're thinking about presenting. Because I could find conflicts all day. <laughs> it's, we're not in the business of finding problems. We're in the business of finding solutions. And that's what makes our project smoother. So it's really tough to, I don't know, you're probably gonna tell me you have a problem. No, it's valuable. I mean, you're saying like chase experience, not money. Like you're, that, I mean, that's one of the sales pits for the people that work for you. And I, you know, the one tough thing, I mean, I look at hiring just to build on that. You know, I found experience is important, but it's not everything, right? I mean, company culture is really important. You know, how do they get along internally? Because if we have internal conflicts, well, this business is tough enough to like, at internal conflicts with client conflicts and trade conflicts and then just the market in general. But clients can sniff that out. They can. And straight and, up, like if you have a problem in, in internally, it doesn't take much for a client to sniff it out nope. and go, so hey, what's what's the issue? There? What's the it's deal? Like, yeah. 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 It, it, it's just as bad as them thinking that you're spread too thin between other projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so that's huge. I found that if they're good communicators, like – I, I have found that, you know, our superintendents and coordinators and PMs, like I'll give them a lot of kudos and props here because they're very good communicators and they're good with people, they're good with clients, they're good with subs. And so 
I found that when our clients like them because they're likable and the trades like them, I mean, yeah, you still have to lay down the law, if you will, and be assertive, you know, don't confuse my kindness with weakness, you know, but, but it, but I've found that that bedside manner is really important because that solves a lot of issues already. But I, you know, the biggest thing that I still try to figure out is, as you mentioned, Johnny, I mean, we have a leash that we give them to not hang themselves, but enough where they can get out and have, you know, they, they have the ability to grow. They're not micromanaged. You know, we empower them, right. To make their own decisions. And, and we have to balance that because notwithstanding the experience level, there's still mistakes that happen. They may miss a survey on the building height and the framers framed it too high. And now we have a structure that's too high and we have to rebuild that roof truss, right. And stick frame it now or whatever. The fact like Uh, the catch that though, like having a checklist, would it catch it? You know, it may have, it may have still maybe. met the, you know, maybe, but it, it's tough. Like, how do you, how do you dial it in to go back real quick? I, I feel like the personality has to be like, like a mom, like my mom, she'd be screaming at me. Like I did something wrong and then she'd answer the phone. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> like, you know, it's like, you have to have that, you know, you're not so kind, but at the same time, you're like, what's happening? Like, so I think that's how I looked at it where it's like, you can have that switch, but you do have to drill down on whether it's a sub, even a client sometimes, like some clients can, you know, you get two, three touches a day with a client and then they're like, so what's going on? It's like, bro, Hey, we've had these talks (laughs) on build a trend. I've put it in emails and we've talked three times this day. That's not how the structure was made out for percentages. You know, it's like, to go back to your earlier question is, you know, the best question, I, the best answer I had for the question of, you know, percentage, like, Hey, how much does it, you know, can we, uh, yeah, I can get so-and-so to do it for 10% for the build. One of the clients we had that's recent and they go, Hey, can we knock down that? They walk through the whole line on a budget. And at the end they go, can we knock on, can we knock down your number on percentage? I'm like, absolutely. If we have clients that will pay full price. So I have no problem lowering the level of, you know, Resp- what was it not respect but i screwed it up already was um oh man i was like we don't need to show up here as often we'll show up here 15 percent less because you want to break on the o p so it's like if you don't value that then we don't need to value the project as yeah. much so it's like and they were like absolutely not we want we want you here all the time so it's like all right yeah so, so I mean, do you ever have clients say that's fine i'm trying to save a dollar or do most of them it, it really hits home once you give them that analogy uh, it's hit home, but I, I also feel like that a certain value of client that they're, they're going to test you regardless, um, that they want to know how it is that you value yourself. And it's, it's not a numbers thing. It's a more of a value that, you know, do you value this company? Do you value this project? Or are you just going to, you know, I, it's like I've had, you know, let's say a landscape designer present this amazing design and then the client goes, well, can we change this up? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. It's like, well, are you going to stick firm to your design that you created or are you just going to do whatever I say? You know, so it's like you have to, as the professional, be something that's going to stand up to it and have the right answers that even though I just screwed up that analogy, but it was like, you know, no, I, I can't do that. Instead of saying no and being confronted, it's like, you know, I love that book, Never Split the Difference, you know, and it's, it's all about having them say no and anchoring stuff and having that pause and going, yeah, I, I could change that, but do you want me to value this project less? They say, no, there you go. You just answered it yourself. But if you say no, then you've created this kind of confrontation that's irrelevant in the conversation. doesn't help either party, but it's, it's the fact that, you know, it's how you get there. And I couldn't do that for 12 years, 13, whatever, 14, 20 years. It's, it took me this long to get to a point where I felt comfortable. It's like, I'd always be like, you know, we'll mark up a project 16% because I want 14. I want to give them the win and we'll do that. And now it's just like, no, now that I know my numbers, I know what my insurance, my workman's comp, we did a 401k, you know, all these things that, that come into play. It's like, no, it's only squeezing me. So where do I get it from? That's the other answer is like, okay, you want to knock this down? We can dilute quality. Is that what you want to do? No. Okay. Well, then there you go. Then we can't do that. There's the only way to find that is to either when I was younger, I didn't know that, Hey, we can just break. That's why my, my, my uh, quotes are so detailed because when you have a client, when you do like a lump sum or just put bulk numbers to stuff, 
when a client goes, hey, let's pull the basement out. And you'd be like, oh, well, it's so much worth to rewrite it because it's not that detailed and I'm, I've got fluff in there. I put 20% in that when I hit it here and all that stuff. So it's like, how do you do it right? And it's just being completely transparent and dialing in all these areas. So that way, if someone wants to phase the project because of budget, you're not forced to, to diminish your, your OMP or your management numbers that's going to basically have an impact on quality. But you can pull a sleeve away and go, hey, I don't need to do the basement right now. We can access that two years from now when you're ready to go. And you haven't had to corrupt anything. So it, it's, it's stuff like that that really, um, that's really changed the game for me. And it, it's only come from experience. Well, yeah. And that's, I, I think that's part of the value is people that want to jump out on their own. I mean, what you express, Johnny, is that th there is a talent to understanding how to communicate on the business development side, right? Because as you mentioned, if, if a client says, Johnny, give me a discount, as you mentioned, you just say, no, well, you're stonewalling them. I mean, it's just like, okay, well, you know, it's not that it's not the right answer, but it's the delivery. And whereas if you were to say, okay, you know, I'll discount the supervision or the quality. Well, then it hits home. Okay. I value what Johnny offers and I want to pay for that. I, I understand the value and investment I'm making in Johnny for what he's going to do and vintage is going to do. And that's how you offset that. Right. And I do love that book. That's a great book. Um, you know, so that knowledge and education and knowing your numbers, I think that's the biggest thing that we spoke about, you know, just having a controller now having full confidence, knowing my numbers. I know if I discount it, I can't, keep my doors open. I can't stay in business. And, and then you'll take it from somewhere else. Yeah. Like, and that's, you have to keep the doors open. Yeah. And if you want good people, like I found, you know, to eliminate turnover, well, I, I want to create a company where the people that work here ha can have a good livelihood, you know, support their families and own a home and have these things. Well, it comes at a price. I mean, it's not cheap, but they, they work hard. They believe in the vision. They believe in AFT. They believe in what we're doing. So I have to compensate them for that, but I also have to bill for that. And the clients have to understand how much emotion that my team's putting in, how much they value their home. And, you know, how do I portray that, whether it be social media or communication on the business development to make that a win-win for everybody? 100%. I, I also think that, you know, you have to do it where, like, I like how you promote people on your Instagram. I think, and same with LinkedIn, like I said before, is that you, you can't be about Brad. You can't be about John. Because if, if that's the case, then people could take shots at that and try and diminish that and take something away from you, whether it's your success or whatever it is. But when you make it about a team and a family, whoever it is, whether it's a client that's bickering about 10 grand, when they, when they know the whole time, it's not just you. It's a team that's behind it. They know Emily, the bookkeeper. They know Paul is super. They know all these different people that are involved. It's like, do you want to short them on the effort? You know, one of the things that we've tried to do is, is make it about quality experience in the details and that we don't take deposits. You know, we, we, if we're doing a window order, obviously we do that. But in the beginning, you don't need to put a deposit of 30% down on us because we only bill as we go. So every two weeks, you know, it, it's, you know, cash flow is not the easiest, but it, it pushes us to honestly bill on a timely basis because if we don't, we're going to get behind on it. And then we're the ones covering and financing the project. So, you know, we want to really show it that, Hey, you're getting something the whole time, meaning whether it's the first drop of that stuff that week we bill for, you know, dumpster portage on all that stuff. Cause it's there. You can see it it's tangible. It makes the relationship. It solidifies that relationship of both that you're driven on something that's, that's actual tangible. Not just, like, oh, well, you know, I'm 20% and that holds my, my calendar date for the next year. And, and I get all that. I love all that. But until that I am financially stable with the numbers and how we work them all, I want to make sure that that's not my account. And it's, I don't have to worry about five different accounts because my focus has been on production. You know, and so, so now that Benny's going to move into that role with our bookkeeper, can you know put a better eye on that and then they can talk to each pm about when they're invoicing and all that stuff so yeah i'm not going to say in, in a year from now we won't be doing that because we have it more dialed in but that's one of the things that we didn't do because it forced us to invoice on time because we knew there wasn't a cushion there and you know better or worse that's what's that i said managing cash flow is everything it really is it's because, you know, you got the mason who wants to get paid the day of and it's like, you know, can I get paid? It's like, you didn't even give me an invoice yet. How, how do I, how do I give that to my bookkeeper? And there's other guys that, you know, they, 
you know, you, you ask them every week. And then at the end of the project, they're like, Hey, I need 37,000. It's like, yo, I haven't, you know, and so everyone has to be on the same page. So that's one of the processes that, you know, written down process, but just in general, as we hire a new PM, we're trying to dial it in where as everyone knows what's happening on the job site. So it's not Benny and me doing it all. Every invoice that comes in that week goes into a, a, a Dropbox folder. So that way our bookkeeper can see it, Benny and myself. So that way we know we're not tracking down invoices for that week. You get me? It's all right there. And then that becomes a shared folder with the client. So that way they see the backup for every week. So it's a two for one. So it's all sitting in there. And I, and I want to dive into this because I think cash flow and billing is really important. And I'll talk about our system. But before that, the point you made when you talk about being the face of the company and being a more team approach, yes, that, you know, not only does it help with the client interactions and maybe the social media and other things, but one thing that I've noticed too, and this was very early in the conversation is that our clients, even though I'm the face of Instagram or maybe the company, they, they get to see a lot of the other people behind the scenes and what they do and meet them. And they know, like, I'm open with them. I'm not running your project. Like, I, I'm overseeing the company. I'm involved. Here's my cell phone. And I'm, I, especially at pre-construction, I'm very heavily involved in these meetings with architect design and budget. You know, but at some point that, that baton is handed off to my team. And if I don't introduce them or there's no relationship, it's a lot harder for the clients because they want me on the job. And I'm like, well, if I'm on the job, then our company will fail, you know, and your project will fail. So I have to teach them that. So I think that's part of the value of understanding the team and the players behind, you know, Johnny or Brad or whatever company it may be. Well, I also think it's valuing your team. I think there's a lot of companies out there that, that do the me talk and the I talk where it's me, me, me. So then you almost, you know, tie yourself up where you, you, you have to be at that job. Like, because that's what they expect. And I, I found myself doing that where it's like, there, there's something about the first couple of years of being in business where you're almost at this hyper cycle in the sensitivity where you're like, I, everything's got to be right. Like this, nothing's worth it where you might build 24 years of experience like I have, but the next product is the only thing that's valuable to our clients and potential clients because, or architects, because they don't care what you did. Like it's, it's like, like leave, you ever do a reference list and it's like, Oh, that was a great client. Then you look at it. It's like, that was five years ago. I can't put that on there. I'm yeah. a different person. Yeah. You know, like I didn't start growing a beard till last year. Like you just, you know, th things change. So it's like, how do you, you also want to think what we haven't talked about is having a huge amount of empathy and not forgetting the fact that you might do this every day, four or five times a day and be really good at it your client's never done this before. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like talking to your AV guy and he's like, well, I'm going to put a switch over here that'll control every amp. It's like, bro, slow down. No one has a clue what you just talked about. So it's, I find myself, cause I go quick, I go fast. And one of the best things I heard from a business coach was not just delegating and circling back, but before you leave that conversation, ask for a question ask them for a question. So that way it's like, Hey, so this is this mantle. I do a lot of drawing. I draw this mantle out, blah, blah. Here's all the stock. This, I want to use it. You know, what do you think of this? Like, do you like this design? And then you just, I watch people's eyes. I can't tell you how valuable it is. Like when a client walks in a project or, you know, an architect, I watch their eyes. It's like, what do they look at too long? You know, and then I go stand at that exact position and then try and angle it and, you know, try and figure out what time of day it was, what's the glare they're looking at and try and find out what it is. Or like when you're walking around a house and maybe you've been dealing with the wife the whole time and then the husband shows up. So you're still talking with her. Okay. And you're in the kitchen, but yet you're eavesdropping on what he's looking at because you don't know what his reaction has been. And I point blank tell a client, like on one job I have, the husband I deal a lot with and, and the wife hasn't been on the project a lot. And I, I just told him straight out, I go, I'm going to be looking at you a lot during this walkthrough because I've seen him almost every day, but I really want to get your reaction, which you may not be comfortable telling me, but your face won't lie. And I think that, how do you teach that? Like, how do you teach a PM or a superintendent to pick up? Oh, sorry, I'm shaking the whole table. <laughs> how do you pick up all those little, those little nuances? nuances? Yeah, the little. And that's where like... Uh, my, my process page for walkthroughs won't do much. It's really making sure I'm there and that I walk my PM through it and go like a debrief after a client meeting where maybe I ran the meeting 
and then I asked the PM, like, hey, what do you think of that meeting? Just getting their, you know, a, a debrief, their, their reflection of what they saw at that meeting. So that way I understand what they value. Maybe they just don't value the same things because they just don't have the experience or have the, it's, this isn't a relationship to them. This is a job. You know, this is, I become great friends with a lot of our clients, almost all of them. And not that I'm, it's not like Instagram friends. Like you and I are friends, but you know, my 40,000 followers, I don't have 40,000 friends. <laughs> like, you know, that's a huge hang up where everyone's like, Oh, I'm super popular. No, I, I really, that's why the other part of it, you said, how do you hire great employees? It's, it's the same thing I said with clients is you only need a, num a short number of them, you know? So it's like, if it's like buying a house, you fall in love with one and then someone, you know, buys it off and then you, you fell in love. Guess what? You're going to fall in love with the next three, but if you don't keep looking, so having, you know, having on your website, you know, come join our team. Mm -hmm. so you're always seeing a resume. Always you're always, yeah, even you're always you're hiring, yeah. you're actively pursuing. It, it's just because it's the same thing as if you find that painter, you find that one painter that, that is on the same job with this project. It's all, you're always impressed by the job. It's like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to that guy's number or that girl's number. Same thing as employees. It's like whoever you saw at a project and they weren't happy and you don't poach people, but you just never know. You're just always keeping your ears open and never being so laser focused on something else that you've missed it. It's always that, that quote I say from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. If we don't stop and look around, you know, you might miss it. And it's really the same thing is you can't just be focused on the project. And I found that, you know, whether it's COVID's really taught me that where, you know, we work, 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 but you know, when was the last time I called one of my friends, you know, it's, it's a touch base because this thing can be totally, over I don't think it is for you. At least that's the appearance. Yeah. This, this isn't overwhelming where it's, you have time. Like I don't even have time to figure out, you know, how I, you know, you know, have an anniversary dinner or something like that. You know, it's, it's really, <laughs> I hate to say it that way. It looks like it's amazing on social media, but it's, it's a lot of hustle. Yeah, like, it is a lot of hustle and we're all piecing it together. But I think to your point, it's, it's funny as I've met with executives and CEOs and business owners, I think the one thing that always rings una unanimous with all of them and you talked this, you know, in the beginning, it's like, you know, leaders are, CEOs are visionary, right? They, they work hard, but they're efficient, right? They're optimistic. And, you know, these are things you mentioned early on, but I think the biggest thing too is Johnny is they realize what they're not good at and they hire people that are better than them at certain things. And I look at that, I mean, being transparent, I mean, I look at Adam, my PM and this guy, I mean, he could take a set of plans and dissect it in 10 minutes and find everything that's incorrect and go back to the architect and engineer and be like, you know, with their civil drawings or the drainage or the elevations and he can find stuff right away. And I, I don't have the skill set at his level. And that's why I have him working through that pre-construction scope, you know, and, you know, going back to the billing I've looked at, you know, when I've brought him a call as controller, I see she's so strong with the financials where, you know, we're us, we're dealing with the bank. So going back to the cash flow, it's like every month we bill for the bank, we get one draw a month. And so she had the idea, like, Brad, I know construction, I've been a coordinator, but if I go in the field and I bring in our legal guy, Patrick, who does all of our contracts and insurance and stuff. So once a month they go out in the field, McCall and Patrick, and they meet with our superintendent and PMs and they'll ask him, okay, Johnny, are you done with cabinetry? Are you done with countertops? What deposits are upcoming? You know, where are we at? And so they ask these hard questions. Now these guys know they're coming. They know how to answer and they're prepared. And I've found that that's valuable because our office staff now is in tune with our projects, what stage they're at, what phase they're at and percentage complete. And it just makes that process a lot better for us. Yeah. I don't have a, I have a legal guy, but he's not in house. <laughs> and that's like when I started the company, the two biggest things we said, my wife said, you need to have somebody that's going to over yeah. look over your books. Or something. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so I had a, I had a, a, an accountant basically, he can see all my credit card statements, all my um, QuickBooks and see all my accounts that I have. I only have two or three accounts. I, I think to, to jump off that point is, you know, when was it, like I'm having, what I'm trying to figure out is when did you find enough cushion or was there ever cushion in what you were making a, as a company to make it easier to make that transition to, to hire somebody that made just as much as you at the time, you know, there's a hierarchy like, Oh, you know, I make X amount of dollars. So I, I can't hire this guy for the same amount of money or this girl. 
and the reality is, is some of the greatest stories I've heard is that there's a point where some of my employees will make more than me. Yep. For, and it will happen. Because of that growth. Yeah. I'm so there. When, <laughs> when, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. So it, I, I guess that's, that's what I try and figure out. That's the struggle. So my question there that's buried in there deep is, was it the company making enough money for you to be able to take that risk? Or was it a point where you got a credit line or something like that to give you enough cushion that, hey, I can burden this for a six month review period to see if this is going to be the right fit where even if it didn't go well, I'm not going to have to squeeze my lifestyle, my company, or the project quality or experience to make this transition for the company. You know, that's a great question, Johnny. So here's how I looked at it. And just to share some insight, how I looked at our business. I mean, I, I think a lot of starting a company, it's not where I am today. It's where I'm going to be. And I knew from day one, you know, we're doing a small kitchen remodel. We're doing a bathroom, whatever. And, I, and I've talked about that, but I knew where I wanted to be. I knew someday we're going to be doing these massive custom homes. We're going to be doing these massive commercial projects but I had to get there, right? I had to take the journey. I had to build credibility. I had to build marketing. I had to build qualifications that I can do this and complete it in a timely manner. And I've had, you know, architects and designers and realtors tell me that, Brad, we were waiting, we were watching you, but we had to wait till you got to this level that we could refer you. I mean, that's just the reality of our business to show that I'm not just some young guy, but we can get there. And so to that point, Johnny, it was really, I would say two and a half years ago, so after my company has been five and a half years, right, where I got to that happy medium where now I have some projects that generate uh, a good fee because they're high projects, they're high dollar projects, they're very high in custom homes. Not only do they dictate a high fee, but they dictate a high qualification, which means I have to bring in the right person that's qualified to do this complicated hillside. And that's where I had to get them and retain them. I had to pay them. And that meant their salary is more than mine, but they're a salary and I'm owner, right? I'm building this for my 10, 15, 20 year goal of the company. So yeah, my, my financial position is different, but for them, their salary on day to day is different. And it did take about six years, but there has to be a medium where, you know, lines of credit can be tough because if you're taking out money for salary and an economy goes down, I mean, there's some, we had to build a little nest egg in our account where we could say, yeah, we're ready now. We have the, the project, we have the capital and the wherewithal where I can bring in this guy and pay him a high salary because it's merited. Yeah. I think I, I heard you talk about that. Um, either right when COVID hit, we all, I think everyone was talking about what they had for nest egg. Mm -hmm. and it was like, we had just gotten to a point where we had three months of salary for the company. Right in our savings account and then COVID hit and it was just like, great, awesome. I'm glad we have that because we're going to burn through it. Cause you know, we, we, we've said to our guys, we actually have all guys, so no girls, but it was like, Hey, we said it from the beginning. We don't want to have any turnover in this company. We, we've devoted everything to you guys. So whatever questions you have, whatever mistakes you make for the most part, we'll be there for you. We'll have your back. So, cause you want them to, I've worked for companies where I've thought for a year, that every mistake I make, I'm going to get fired for. And that's one of the most stressful and toxic ways environments can be. So you want to give them enough cushion when you're comfortable. And it's, it's tough to do that. You know, it's, it's how do you get to a point where you're comfortable with having all your employees, but also that, Hey, you're going to, you're going to devote everything to them. Meaning, Hey, and then you have to then sit down with them and go, we had this meeting two weeks ago. It's like, you know what? The, the owners have been pulling their weight you guys don't wait for us to give you more work or more responsibility. Start taking it off our plates. You know, feel, we, we give you all the other freedom. So take this away as well. So it's, it was just having another talk with them because we have been seeing a lot of great resumes and we're now comfortable with like, you know what? I'm going to throw a little bit more money at that because I want to flip the burden. I don't know if you see it this way. If I hire someone that's a PM, that's, you know, I can see potential in them, but they don't have the resume or the background or the experience to really hammer out this project, but I'm going to pay them a little bit more for them to grow. And that burden's still on me to teach. But let's say it's the other way where they have an amazing experience. They need a truck. They need this. I'm going to do that because guess what? Now it's the burdens on them to produce. I've done all my parts. It's like giving a carpenter all the tools, all the materials and the design guess what? 
it's not on me anymore to create something awesome with that fireplace. It's a hundred percent on your talent. So how do I get it to be on their talent and not going, well, I'm not paying them quite what the rate is, you know, but you know, they're going to make do, you know, it's so the burden's still on me. So it's, you know, I've given, it's like giving that car, that same carpenter 80% of the materials, they have to buy nails themselves. Some of the tools are there, but then there's no drawings. You know, that's what's happened with some employees. And then, so it's, if they don't advance far enough, I guess the, the right thing to see here is if they haven't advanced as fast as your projects and your company has advanced, then you need to turn back and peel that back a little bit and go, are they going to be a right fit long term? Yeah. And, and how do you fix that, you know, from a management standpoint, what do you have to do internally? Is this a me problem now? Because I'm not setting them up for success or giving them the revenue or business development to be successful. I mean, for me, it was, there, there was a certain turning point where we had a certain amount of projects where Adam, I could pull him out of the field. He's not running the project. Now he's in the office running all pre-construction. Okay. Then I had to get to the point this past January, I need to bring on this target PM. Okay. Well, now I'm at a position where I can do that. Even though that I knew the salary, I had him waiting for a year, but finally we hit that point where we could bring him on. And, you know, I, I'm not a financial guy, right? But I do know that what we as Americans, and this is a whole political thing, which I don't want this to go sideways, but, but why on a personal level should I not have a year of savings for my wife and I? I, I live pretty conservatively. I have six kids, but why have two months? Why not have a year? Why not have a year as a company, AFT, why don't I have a year of salary to carry my team, right? Um, because the value, I don't look at this as, yeah, we're making a profit. I'm going to cash out tomorrow. I look at this in 10 years from now. And by being sustainable, I saw in the last recession living in Arizona that the companies that weathered that storm, I mean, they came out just light years ahead of everyone else. And it will come. So why not be prepared that we have the marketing, we have the branding, we have the reputation. So let's hold serve. Let's hold this. Let's weather the storm when it comes. And then that way we're even more opportunistic and ready for when that, you know, the second wave comes. Yeah. I was blown away by that. I was like, isn't that like too much money to have in, <laughs> in the back pocket? Cause I feel like I, I, I do feel like there's a lot of people that leverage that money to then create something else. Like if I have, and they lose I, and not that they always lose, but why, why, why does it always happen? Okay. I have 500,000 now let's catapult this. Let's buy some land. Let's do this. I mean, Yes, th there is a fine line where you do not become successful being conservative. Like we understand that you have to take risk, but there's also a fine line where you can still take risk, but you can still be conservative and still balance that in a position, you know, in the overall. And it all depends on what your goals as a company as well. Yeah, risk tolerance, all that stuff. It, it's it's. There's also those those guys on you know, IG that are like, "Whoa, well, have your money work for you while you're <laughs> while you're working," and. I don't have that. I'm, I'm trying to get to that point. But w with that said, I mean, we've opened up a, a third bank account that, you know, we have a checking and savings. And now I've done the math where it's like, all right, in every deposit we get from any project, 6% of that can go into a profit account. Every, whether it's a $5,000 check or a $150,000 check, 5% of that or 6% of that can go into this account. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're creating that slush fund. So, I mean, right now, we, we just got a credit line, which gives me a little bit of breathing room where it's like, we've never missed again, knock on wood payroll, which is, which is always tough when you're in your growing company. It's, it's that, it's that, that cloud that's always over your head where it, it, no matter what it's coming. And it's, if you ever miss it once you've, it's like you've cheated on that high school girlfriend. You never get that trust back and everything's relationship based on from And all that reputation you built for three years as vintage is gone. That's the oh, thing. It's so, so it's in, yeah. And it's, and you try and do that and, and it's tough. So we have, you know, a credit line that we'll just use to basically, you know, cover ourselves when you have that Mason that wants that three grand, you know, cover that three grand, that check's definitely coming in. Cause what's great about our clients and that experience is that once you get it going, like we invoice a client, like they wire money, like an hour later, <laughs> it's like, that's the beauty of, you know, not being in the specs and waiting for an investor that lives in Texas to find time to go over a proposal or an invoice for that week. It, it's really, it makes life a lot easier for cash flow because if you want stuff done, and you say this in a lot of pre con, is if you want stuff done, you have to feed the meter. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, whatever you can do. 
hey. you know, you get the invoice for it. It's not like it's magic. You know, we're not doing it where it's like, hey, we're on a credit and, you know, we'll fund the whole thing and you get at the end. Well, you're not the bank either, Johnny, and you shouldn't be. We're not putting a layaway. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's legit. You want us to go? The only way we've had a client go, I, you know, I, I had one client go, you know, I, I can't stand getting these invoices. I'm like, dude, you want 15, 35 people here. Like that's, you're racking up $115,000 a week on this project between outside, inside, all that stuff. You've been begging for this type of productivity. Guess what? It comes with a price tag. You know, it's not like the budget's going through the roof. It's just drawing out of that budget, but at a really fast pace. Like we've done a project that started at $300,000. It was supposed to be a three month project, went to 3 million over 12 months. Do the math and break that down. That's a ton of money going out the door every week, but that's a lot of changes happening. It's a lot of production. We had, I think, 45 guys here last week when we had the food truck. We tried to do a little appreciation. We had a taco truck on the job site. Went, went far. It, people loved it. And it's, it's, but then it's, that, it's those little moments. I'm with my assistant, my super. We're at our desk, and I'm like, this will be huge for, for the job site, the morale. And I don't think we talk about that enough. It's just how do you, when you're on a big product, sometimes it can just get like, oh, same job again, same thing, you know? It's like deja vu. How do you create it fun? Like I've all, before COVID, I was going to have a dunk tank to a job site, you know, that way you can like have it fun, you know, put certain people, super, supers on it and, you know, supervisors. But yeah, it's, it's tough to make this as fun. I look at it like really, I do look at everything like a relationship is like when I first started, you know, courting my wife at the time, it was like, how do I, how do I keep chasing that? I want to keep chasing my wife, even though we're 15 years deep in a marriage. It's the same as the projects. I want to look at like that chase where it's, it's still unique. It's a challenge. That's what I loved about this industry is that any project, whether it's the same architect or whatever, it, it's changed by, like you said, the job site. The job sites are always different. The different times of weather that you start a project. I mean, Arizona is Arizona. I'm sure it comes with its, its flaws, but for the most part, you don't have this big dip in seasons like we right. do in it. It's, right. But it's, but that's the fun in it. You know, that's what keeps me young at heart, you know, and, and keeps me energized about the products because I can walk on a job site and, and almost forecast what I'm going to fall into. You know, I always look at it like a PM. I think any PM, any super, any owner, you should be able to be blindfolded and, and put onto a job site, whether it's I go to Arizona and, and Brad takes me, this is how I walk products, blindfold me and then open me up in that project. I want to be able to figure out the next six people I need to talk to, next six people I need to call, and then what I need to order. And that's what I do every day. It's, it, it hasn't changed since the first day. And it's, that's what I try and figure out and, and work with it. Well, I love that you share that, Johnny. It's funny because I, you know, we, leading up to this, just for listeners, I mean, we have some topics here that Johnny and I wanted to talk about. And we've probably gone through three of the 20 because <laughs> there's just so much there. And it's funny because we're going to, I am going to schedule you for round two at some point because there's just something to dive into. But, but I love that you shared just the passion. I mean, the chase. I mean, I, you said this on your podcast I listened to and I feel the same where, you know, you get this job and there's this rush when they say, you know, Johnny, I'm going to hire you and we're going to do this custom home or commercial project. And there's this rush of excitement to do something new and different and work with this client and, you know, what, what I see, it's funny because we've had, and I know you've been a big spokesman for keep craft, of, keep, keep craft alive and getting young people in the trades. And what I've seen, especially with COVID, I've seen a young generation realize, and I think a lot of it has to do with social media. It has to do with what you're doing and others where they see that there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity making stuff, being in the trades. I mean, I was fortunate. I was at lunch with my wood guy here in Scottsdale and this young kid came up and he said, Hey, I recognize you from Instagram, Brad. And I followed you. I was from California and I'm 20. Like I, my dream is to work for AFT and I'm working for a commercial builder. And, you know, I see this young generation realizing that in the trades or as a GC, they can be successful. And it's exciting. I feel like social media has been great for that and appreciate what you're doing because I think that energy is very, you know, it's inspiring, right? I see that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that, not to get anyone wrong. It's a tough business. Like, this is not, everything's not perfect. Like it sees like every day we're dealing with internal struggles and things with our clients and trades. I mean, it's, it's a tough boat to keep on direction and keep moving. 
Exactly. But I think you're also doing the same thing. I mean, we've hooked up with fine home building and, and, and help promote the keep craft alive, which has you know scholarships and all that. And then we created our podcast to kind of help tell the story. Cause you know, I've been doing this for 24, maybe 25 years. And when I first started, you know, I think in early two thousands, I think it was 97 when I was a carpenter a laborer, but when you go off on your own, and I think it's, it's true for a lot of people still is that you're on your own. You know, when, when things get bad and a client turns on you, you only have you and like the cab of your truck to sit yep. there and scream, you know, and, it, and I've, I've watched, we don't talk about the mental health, but you know, one of the things that I love and I also can hate about it is that there'll be times where you're driving from job to job. And the only thing that you can do is eat away at your mind is what you're thinking. What did you do wrong and play it out over and over again. And I feel like it's a game of solitaire and, and where did I f- miss that place that card and play it back a hundred different times. So that way I, I don't fall into that same spot for my next client meeting, my next, you know, walk through whatever it is the next time I talk to a sub, but it, it can be very, very tough mentally in mental health on, on what we do. And the burden is very, very high on us. And, you know, financially you screw up, you know, Tyler from our, our podcast is it all the time from TRG. He screws up and it's like five grand. I screw up and it's $50,000 mm-hmm. and, and it can be a huge impact because guess what? Credit line or not slush fund or not. That's a huge hit. Mm-hmm. And you're always maintaining that, or it could be bigger than that where it's not value. It could be, you were slacking on, on health and, and safety on your project and it could really impact someone else's family. And that's a huge thing. So we started our podcast to tell stories from like-minded people all over this industry and beyond. And that way, you know, it might be a similar story that we've said before, but guess what? It's, it's the same one that you have and you're not alone. You're like, Oh, you know what? Brad, has got this. He's got all these projects. Always wears a killer college shirt. You know, he's <laughs> always going wherever he is. And he's like, but he's got the same issues. concerns, and, and it's, that's huge because sometimes I do it all the time. Some days you have this imposter syndrome where it's like, why are you interviewing me? I don't have my stuff together just like anyone else on any given day, but it's how you pull through that and make it through that Tuesday and crush it on Friday and make it all happen. That's experience and you chalk it up to that and you're, you're, you're creating a great product for you. I think that's the biggest thing is how do you create a product that most clients won't know the difference between mediocre and great, you know, unless they've done it before or they, there was a certain expectations with an architect or rendering but it's really what are you doing that's your best work, that's your growth. And that can eat your life too. It's really, it's a, speaking of just tough industry, it, it is that way. So that's why we started our podcast to kind of give back a little bit to this industry and, and tell stories of success, failure, and everything in between that. And it's been, it's been, it's resonated huge in this industry. No, I love that, Johnny. I mean, it's, I'm a big fan and, Again, I mean, we, you know, insurance, bonding, mitigating risk, you know, company culture. I mean, those are all things that we'll touch on because I think you have a lot to offer there. So I guess we'll tee that up for next time. But in the meantime, where can our listeners find you and what's upcoming and exciting for you? Jeez. Oh, uh, you can find me on two social media accounts. It's uh, here's Johnny H. Like the show. Hold on. You need, see, I, I, I can barely run one. You're running two. So that's part of it right there. But name, I, I, I have a few. I actually probably have seven or eight on my IG <laughs> just so I can get the first seven likes for my own photos. No. <laughs> analytics, seven likes, seven saves, seven four. <laughs> no. So here's Johnny H on Instagram, vintage builders on Instagram. Um, we have vintage builders development and then the modern craft, modern dot craftsman on Instagram. All those are, are how you can find us and help the industry. And we actually big news. We created a nonprofit out of the modern craftsman. Awesome. So um, all the sponsors and all that stuff we have through the podcast will be going through a scholarship fund and we have some big things we're trying to announce and in, in all my, all oh, my spare time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, we're trying to create this, um, you know, really give back to that entry level or uh, we're going to start a, uh, you know, no regrets or no excuses campaign that we're going to start. And we're working with a lot of different companies to kind of launch that in the first of the year. Our goal was IBS, you know, to go to that event and really kick it up a notch where 
everyone else wants to keep craft al- keep craft alive and use the hashtag, but no one's really doing anything to make it happen. Mm-hmm. And so we have to raise that bar if no one else is going to. So yeah, that's that's our goal, and it's it's been big news. So um, it's been fun. But yeah, and then you know vintagebuilders.org. I know it's an org. We're trying to buy dot com, but it's like <laughs> nineteen grand. I don't know. Some guy in Texas owns it. <laughs> uh, so that's the website it's launched it's new i think we're opening up the firm page this week this week we want to launch the first couple pages and then the firm page will get with the company page will get uh, launched this week and then right after that the process page you're gonna love it I, I drew this whole diagram on on the process page i was gonna pull my notebook out it's uh you love it brad it's this process page where i've never seen it before anywhere it's this path for the project oh that's so, awesome I'm holding it up so i drew this out and it's it's the whole path yeah. so when you when you put your mouse over this path you know the cursor all these different things will pop up like they're out the process between pre-construction the idea construction and there's a little line right here that's red that will be the stress oh, i'm doing it backwards stress level so as it'll change to be uh, red to blue, like there'll be different anxiety levels throughout the build. So it's going to take another three weeks for our web guys to create this process, but you'll be able to go on that process page. I'll have all the written stuff and all the videos and cool stuff, but you'll be able to, as a client, be able to put your cursor over it and go, what's my expectation here? No one ever talks about the, you, you know, we didn't talk about this at all, but you make almost all your selections ahead of time on your projects. Yep. And that I'm, just on raw respect. I love that. But I, I just, the, the creative part of me is like, I also, I want to know how you deal with, this can be for another podcast, but once it's framed, you're not building like uh, this room that's nine by 14. You're building massive spaces. So when someone walks into that space and sees it for the first time, and they've had all these select, like I deal with it where we build the house and then we make selections as we go through the build. So that way they can walk it and get a sense of it. I can sharpen it in the floors and they're really getting to know the house as they build it and make these decisions. And still when they pick tile before sheetrock and then all this stuff comes in, like the cabinets, the tile, the paint colors, all that comes in at like the, the three quarter mark of the project. And they start freaking out because like, Oh my gosh, I made all these decisions. Are they going to be right? And I've invested all this time. We're talking a three month window. You might be talking even double that. How does that work? Like, oh, I got some answers for you on that. And that'll be <laughs> another half an hour discussion. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, Johnny. Well, we definitely uh, left some cliffhangers and dangled some carrots out there for those listening. But, you know, I know you're busy. You have your own podcast and you spent an hour and a half with us today. So can't thank you enough, Johnny. You're a good man. It's, it's fun to connect. Absolute pleasure.